Today we're going to do a quick review for before the final examination. So this is the last lecture. The upcoming three lectures will be using them for the design project uh, starting on Thursday. So today you're just going to go over everything we covered and see how everything fits together, how everything uh, can be used somewhere in your mechatronics projects. So this is, uh, I, I want this to be more of a informal discussion about different topics. So I'm going to go over them. And in this process, if you have any questions, we can discuss um, as we go, okay? So don't hesitate to ask questions. If there is anything that is not clear um, about a specific topic, this is your opportunity to ask questions about it. So this is where we started. We started by introducing the mechatronic control loop. We have essential parts here for any mechatronics project. And specifically, we have a mechanical system or an electrical mechanical system. We have an actuator that provides power to that mechanical system. We have a power electronics unit that provides power to the actuators, the controller itself, and then we close the loop with analog or digital sensors. So the mechanical system was covered in, I would say, dynamics or even control systems. The controller was part of control systems. Our focus was power electronics and actuators together to see how we can now interface a mechanical system with a controller, a high power unit and a low power unit, and now how we integrate them through the power electronics and the actuator part. And what exactly, what, what kind of power electronics we need for specific types of actuators. In your design project, you probably uh, you're probably following this exact structure. And there are many different projects. We have 22 different projects. And in any of them, we have some sort of control scheme like this that combines all three, all these three elements. Then let's do a quick review about the type of actuators we used. Most of them were uh, electric machines, uh, ro rotary uh, electric machines. So. We can classify them as electric motors, except uh, with the exception of solenoids. Everything else was rot uh, rotary machines. We have two main kinds, AC and DC. For the DC, the is typically the one you're going to use most often in mechatronics. We can have different categories of DC motors, step, stepper motors, brushless, solenoid, or special machines uh, that operate in a hybrid mode, combining different types of motors. For the stepper motors, we have three main, main, main types, the reluctance motor. The reluctance motor has simply a ferromagnetic part inside. It doesn't have magnets, a permanent magnet motor, and a hybrid motor. Now, there is some confusion here with the required drive for a reluctance motor. A reluctance motor is a uh, unipolar motor in the sense that you cannot revert we don't have to reverse the current in a reluctance mode so i see a lot of design projects using h bridges to control reluctance stepper motors and that is not necess necessarily useful because an h bridge provides a means of switching the current po between positive and negative in a reluctance motor the torque provided is always in the same direction regardless of the direction of the current so just to clarify that, we have brushless and brushed motors, DC motors, solenoids that actuate, that operate in the same principle, and again, special machines that are a combination of the others. So the DC motor is the one we most likely use in mechatronics projects, but it could also use AC motors. You see in drones, for example, uh, we, we are using brushless motors. Motors, but the way they operate is very similar to an AC machine. For an AC machine, we have also three main kinds, the asynchronous, the synchronous, and the single phase motor. For the synchronous motor, we define a synchronous motor by a motor that operates at the uh, synchronous speed. That speed depends only on the frequency and the number of poles in the stator winding. most likely used for systems that only required a fixed speed. And the advantage of synchronous motors 
Again, the main advantage is that the torque and the speed can be controlled independently. The torque does not affect the speed because the speed in a synchronous motor always follows the synchronous speed. In a asynchronous motor, which we also call a induction motor, things are slightly different. The asynchronous motor runs is likely at a is likely lower speed than the synchronous speed. Otherwise, there would be no torque developed. How do we control torque and the speed in a synchronous motor? How do you control torque and the speed in a synchronous motor? Any idea? If you want to control the speed, what should we change? How do you control the speed in a synchronous motor? Frequency. Frequency, very good. We control the frequency, same for, for the asynchronous, synchronous and asynchronous. How do you control the torque in an induction motor or asynchronous motor? Through the? Through the? Current. Through the current, through the voltage. Yeah, through the voltage or through the current. Right, and that would then give us the torque. So this is the a summary of all motors we saw. And depending on the application, we may choose one motor over another. So now let's go over each of them and see their advantages and limitations. So starting with the DC motor, the brushed DC motor. So the main advantage of the brushed DC motor is that they are relatively easy to control compared to the other ones. We have a linear speed torque curve, right, and that makes the control, uh, also control a linear, which makes it easy to implement and control. If we want to control the speed, control the voltage, if you want to control the torque, we can control the current and we can do them independently. They are typically used for medium speed operations. They have a very high starting torque or stall torque. That's an advantage. They operate with DC voltages, which is typically what you're going to find in mechatronics projects. And they can last uh, up to 2000 hours or plus. The main limitations is because you have brushed motors, you remember the collectors that are uh, alternating the direction of current to, to the winding, those require maintenance and that's what limits the um, lifetime of these motors. They are also not very efficient at 60 to 75% of efficiency. It's not necessarily um, great for uh, an electric machine. The other advantage is that you can find DC motors that are micro DC motors, like the one you see on the left, on the right, two big ones that can deliver uh, the order of kilowatts of power. What else can you say about DC motors? Other than that, the interfacing with a microcontroller is relatively straightforward with an H bridge that is sufficient. Induction motors, are motors that are typically deliver higher power. The advantage of them is that you can maintain a speed over a certain range of torque. We can do an appropriate control scheme where the influence of the load is not as uh, visible as it is in a DC motor. We can control them independently here. The efficiency is a bit better, 60 to 90%. They are suitable for speed control, especially in applications where speed is constant. The main limitation is, of course, the size of these motors. The lowest starting torque, the DC motor has a high starting torque, the induction motor has a lowest starting torque, and you remember why, because the impedance of the secondary winding. And uh, the only limitation, I think the major limitation for mechatronics is that here we need three-phase AC. And if you want to control the speed, we need to change the frequency. So we also need now a driver that is able to do that, to go from a DC to a variable AC source variable frequency AC source. So the driver is a better, more complicated to put in place. And then we have the synchronous motor. The synchronous motor, it works similarly to the induction motor. The main difference is that the rotor is powered using an external power supply. In the DC, in the induction motor, no power is given externally to the rotor. Power is taken from the induction from the air gap. Here, an extra power source is applied to the rotor 
winding, it becomes a permanent magnet, which means that it will always follow the position of the magnetic field. And that's what we call why you call it synchronous, because it follows the direction of the rotating magnetic field at the synchronous speed. The main advantage here is again the fact that you can decouple torque and the speed. Torque, the load torque should not affect the speed because the speed is always the synchronous speed. They require to operate a AC and a DC power source, and that's one of the main limitations. Collector uh, rings is will have to be maintained, same as in the case of the collectors for or the um, alter the the collectors for the DC motor. Its starting torque is zero. These motors do not self-start. They need an external way to start them, and once they start, then they maintain the synchronous speed. And they're more expensive to build than induction motors for obvious reasons because you need the collector rings to power the rotor. So induction motors have low starting torque, synchronous motor have no starting torque at all, and the DC motors would be the one with the highest uh, starting torque of these three types. And then you have the brushless DC motors. You'll see this in drones, for example. The idea is similar to a synchronous motor. We have a way here from a DC source to create a changing magnetic field, probably using some sort of um, vector space modulation for a three-phase inverter. As we saw before, we get a DC source, we can now create a vector of resulting magnetic field and make that rotate. As it rotates, the magnets that are inside of this motor will follow that. And as a result, there is no contact, there, there is no need to power the, the rotor. The uh, all parts that are powered are fixed are revol and the only revolving parts are the parts that are not powered. So this makes it uh, this makes it very efficient and also the fact that uh, the speed increases significantly because of the lack of friction. Or no, I wouldn't say the lack of friction, uh, lower friction compared to the other types. They are relatively complicated to control as one main limitation. And uh, here the torque and speed relation is non-linear. Right? But you'll find them for uh, typically for high speed operation. We also say stepper motors. What is the advantage of stepper motors? Well, stepper motors don't require feedback. We are typically using stepper motors for position control. There is no need for feedback. We tell the motor where to go and we expect the motor to go to that position. Right? So there is no need for feedback. We are assuming that the, the motor has sufficient torque to go to that specific step. These motors have typically very high inductor, inductors inside, which means that their maximum speed is limited and they typically operate only at a very low speed. They have a high starting torque, they have a high a stall torque, or I would say maybe holding torque, means the torque that you need to apply to get it moving once the uh, one coil is activated. However, that is also a main limitation in the sense that as we increase the speed of this motor, the torque goes down because we are switching now from one coil to another. We are switching faster. And because of the cutoff frequencies of the coils, the time response of the coils, if you go too fast, we don't give the coil enough time to develop a current. Right, and then the torque goes down. Okay, next one, servo motors. Some of you use servo motors in the design project. And I was a little bit against using servo motors in the design project because it's too easy in the sense that a servo motor is a DC motor with a controller and the power electronics already implemented. Everything is already in one package. So the fun part is already done. They are relatively simple to control in that sense because they typically have a PD controller, proportional derivative controller for no overshoot. And you you send a certain signal to it telling the the the, the, road, the the motor where to go and it just goes to that position. So typically use four speed control, very easy to integrate with the microcontrollers because the power electronics is already implemented here. No power units required. I would, I would say no power electronics required because again, it's all implemented. 
and um, it has an active feedback control operating already inside. The main limitations typically are the limited range of motion, limited speed as well for most of them, and no feedback in most models is available. There's no position feedback available because once again, we are trusting the controller. We tell the controller where to go and you expect it to go there. And um, there is no need for feedback in that sense. Okay, so these are the types of motors, depending on the application you're, to, you're working on, we'll choose one of them. And as you choose one of them, you're also committing to a specific power electronics unit to power them, right? So let's now review some of these power electronics unit where we started and, and build our way to these uh, motors again. Any questions about the this summary of all motors? Question? Yeah. Um, for something like a servo motor, where usually they typically have a very high gear ratio, would it also be possible to assume like minimal or negligible overshoot because of that gear ratio? Yes, the sure the gear ratio will certainly add a lot of friction to the motor, mm -hmm. and um, it will operate at a very low speed. So the chances of having overshoots are minimal. In addition, typically they have a PD controller implemented to eliminate any overshoot. Any other questions? Any other questions? No? Very well. So let's now review briefly the power electronics part. So let's just start with transformers and then build our way to the drivers. If you have any questions during this, let's go through them for each topic. And um, Let's again try to see the development, the, the development from going from transformers, let's say, to the drivers that we require to model a uh, the circuit that we need to, to to model an induction mode. This is the there was one of the early lectures where we talked about transformers, and you see later that an uh, induction and a synchronous motor will need a model like this. So that's one of the reasons we have it early here. So transformers. Transformer primary goal is to change an AC voltage to another AC voltage level. We have two windings that share the same magnetic flux. One main thing to consider that I always see this mistake is people tend to forget that a, the transformer can only work in AC. The magnetic flux induces an EMF that it depends on the derivative of the magnetic flux. So if the magnetic flux is constant, this is zero, there is no current or no voltage induced in the secondary wind. All right, so the alternating magnetic field shared between these two coils here must be uh, alternating. A steady current creates a magnetic field, but a mag steady magnetic field does not create a current. We have two windings to consider, the primary and the secondary winding, each with a resistance, a reactance that represents the leakage reactance. For the primary, we also have the no load current that whose role here is to magnetize the core. And part of that will also dissipate energy in the form of eddy current in the rotor itself, in the, in the, the stator itself. R0 is what represents the eddy current and L0 is the magnetizing inductance. Magnetizing inductance is the uh, represents the amount of energy here we will have to apply to the system to get the core magnetized. This is relatively small, but if we compare this with the induction machine, for example, the induction machine, the magnetizing current will be much higher because in this case of the transformer, the core or the shared magnetic flux is ferromagnetic, the reluctance is relatively low. When you go to the induction machine, we are now dealing with an air gap and to magnetize that air gap, we need a lot more energy, as you're going to see later in the definition of the field energy. Once the transformer, the transformer is loaded, then you can assume that the current going through the, uh, the coil itself is much greater than the magnetizing or the, the uh, no-load current, and then you can neglect the parallel branch. 
Are there any questions regarding transformers? No? Okay. Another common mistake that I see with transformers is the current voltage uh, ratio that is simply depending on, it simply depends on the number of turns. So V1 over V2 equals to that N1 over N2. But if you're now dealing with impedance from the secondary to the primary, that it will depend on the square of the turn ratio, right? So X2, let's say reflected in the primary winding will become X2 times A squared, where A is N1 over N2 which means that the impedance of the secondary affects the impedance of the entire transformer. Otherwise, it would be free energy. So that's a very important concept to keep in mind and something that uh, uh, a common mistake that I see in, uh, in midterms and final examination right, is the confusion between the turn ratio for voltage and current and the turn ratio is squared for impedance transfer from the secondary to the primary or the other way around. So now we have a means to convert to different levels of AC. We can convert also AC to DC, and that's where we used a single uh, phase full wave rectifier. We had two configurations. The first one here, we have a transformer, and then we have di a diode on each side of that transformer connected to a load as follows. In this way, the current that flows through the load is always in the same direction which means that the voltage that appears across the load is always in the same direction, regardless of the sign of the input voltage of VP. For this particular example, if we give that a full wave to the circuit, this is what we're going to see on the load. All negative pulses will be rectified. And if you want to evaluate the efficiency of this, we are typically talking about voltages in terms of root mean square voltage. It doesn't make much sense to talk about average AC voltages because the average of a sine wave is zero, but the root mean square of a sine wave is not zero. That's typically the term we use, the measurement we use to refer to voltages when we are trying to compare AC and DC. Typically, or ideally, we should see a perfectly flat output voltage, but that is not the case. We are rectifying a system, we are creating a nonlinear system this is not perfectly flat but with some filtering we may approach something that resembles a dc voltage this is another example for rectifier this is a bridge rectifier with now four diodes instead of the transformer the idea is exactly the same but now we eliminate the need for a transformer we add diodes so there is more losses because now i have to go through two diodes instead of one and in this example we have a all l E load, which represents a DC motor. Here is the current going through the, coming from the load, the, from the source. And this is the current, sorry, this is the other way around. This is the current going through the load. And this is the current drawn from the source. And you can see how nonlinear the system becomes. Now, if you take this current and rectify it, that is multiply this part by negative one, we get exactly that. Right? So you see that the system is comp is very nonlinear, and this is the type. Of, this is the effect of having the diodes in the, the in the loop now. So with a bridge rectifier, we can create different levels now of DC, go from AC to a different level of. Uh, AC to DC. We can only use transformers to convert AC to another AC source. So transformers don't operate in DC. So what happens now if we want to create different levels of DC from a DC source? Well, we can use a step up or a step down converter. And these are always used in some sort of mechatronics projects. If you are dealing with a DC motor, this is the sort of driver that we are using. This is also very useful when you want to simply have different levels of DC in the same circuit from let's say a 12 volt battery and you want to power your motor at 12 volts but also want to power an Arduino at five volts. So you can step that down to a fixed voltage and then now you have a different level available. 
The idea is very simple. You see that uh, both a step down and step up converter are not very elegant solutions because what you are doing is that you're simply switching the system on and off and then looking at the average voltage you create in the output. In this example, we have what could be seen here as an equivalent DC motor and simply have a switch. When the switch is open, no power is delivered. When the switch is closed, power is delivered. We now take the average voltage across the load and that is uh, a, fun uh, a function of the duty cycle K or how long we keep the switch on in one period. For this particular example here, we can see that as we deliver current to the load, the current goes through the main loop. Once the switch is open, we have the freewheeling diode now that provides another path for the current so that the energy stored in the inductor can be dissipated. And in this particular case, if you look at the current through the load, this is what we should see. From zero to T1, we are delivering power. From T1 to T2, now the current loops uh, through the freewheeling diode and it slowly decays to zero. If you give it sufficient time, the current would go to zero. So this step uh, down converter can only go from the input voltage to zero. So you can only step the voltage down. We can also step the voltage up with a booster converter or a step up, or, uh, up converter. And the idea is a bit different. You see the schematic of the circuit is slightly different. We have two main loops, a first loop with an inductor, and we have also uh, a diode and the load. So what happens here is that when the switch is now closed, we load this inductor. We store energy in the inductor. And when we open the switch, as in the second case here, the inductor was seeing a current that being developed when we open the switch, now the current, we have to go through the load and we are increasing the resistance. So the current will decay, the current will decrease and the inductor doesn't want to see changes in current. So to do that is going to release its own energy to keep the current flowing at the same rate, which means that the energy stored in the inductor is also out delivered, is also delivered to the load. We end up with two voltage sources in parallel, in series, sorry the input voltage plus the voltage across the inductor. And that's the final voltage you deliver to the load. This way we can now increase the voltage from Vs to the voltage across the load. They had a very simple question in the midterm, explain how, what is the process through which a, a step up converter can increase the voltage beyond the power source? And I would say that about half of students could not answer that could not answer that. And that's a problem. It's a big problem. So the concepts behind these schematics, they must be clear, right? Beyond simply using the equation for, uh, what is the equation again? Vs divided by one minus K for the output voltage, right? Well, I, mean, I can give you this, but that's a recipe if you don't understand why uh, this is the case and how this, this, uh, this works. And questions like that will certainly come back for the final examination, as you probably understood from now, I'm not interested in your ability to regurgitate information. I want you to think critically when you answer exam questions. And that's the main idea. That's how engineers work. You know, I, I, I trust that you can apply an equation like that to a problem. So two types of converters. Now we can go from DC to a different level of DC, up or down, depending on the structure we use. Now we can go back to AC from, from a DC source. And this is very powerful. This is very useful in many applications. For this, for any motor control, if you want to switch the voltage applied to it, we'll need some sort of inverter. So this is a H bridge. Here we have two types of H bridges a full bridge and a half bridge. With this specific arrangement, if we choose to, uh, we, here we have uh, transistors that operate as switches. If we choose to operate these two switches, then current flows, flows in one direction. If you choose to operate the other two switches, then current reverses. And if we operate two switches in the same leg at the same time, we create a short circuit. 
our job now is to find the appropriate values for these signals that are go to uh, the blue or the uh, red uh, transistors to create the voltage we want in the H bridge. So in this, we, we can see an H bridge simply as a way to invert the current, but we could also expand the idea and use this as a step down converter with the ability now to change the direction of current flowing through the load. We can go back here to uh, the step down converter. We can use the switch. We can modulate the voltage we want in the output. Well, why not do the same here? This could be a duty cycle signal. Uh, and this duty cycle signal, if we choose this lags, is modulating a, let's say, positive DC voltage in the output. If we now switch that to the blue lags, is modulating a negative signal. So we can go now from Vs, or I would say negative Vs, all the way to plus Vs. This would be a step down converter, but now we also have the ability to reverse the sign of the voltage. This is extremely useful when you want to control a DC motor, a stepper motor, or anything that really requires a voltage going up and down, and is the principle of operation for sinusoidal pulse width modulation which allows us to go from a DC source to a almost perfect sinusoidal waveform in the output. All right, so here is the first idea. If you want to modulate, let's say, in the first graph, these different levels of DC voltage, uh, uh, but now with different signs, well, I would say an AC voltage, we can simply compare our signal with the carrier signal, determine the duty cycle, and I'll give the signals to one of the two pairs of transistors. And this will allow us to create now a voltage that follows the reference signal in blue. Okay. And that's the idea be, uh, behind pulse width modulation. Uh, the PWM signal is uh, simply a way to determine uh, what kind of signals, what kind of duty cycles we need at a given instant in time to recreate a given reference voltage signal. The idea be behind bipolar and unipolar pulse width modulations uh, is exactly the same. Uh, all we are doing here is now taking a sinusoidal input to the system. And this sinusoidal input is what do we want to create in the output. Let's say we want to create a uh, perfectly AC signal in the output from a DC source. You know, the applications uh, could simply be to control, for example, an induction motor. What do we do here? We have two ways to do that. The first way, we have a sinusoidal waveform or reference waveform, and we have a bipolar and a unipolar pulse width modulation system. Uh, I think there is a problem with my pictures. Yeah. yeah. So upper and lower switches in the same leg work in a complementary manner. So these two pictures are swapped, I believe. Right, this one and that one, I think they're in different slides. And so for the bipolar pulse width modulation, we call that a bipolar pulse width modulation because the way we create these reference signals is such that at a given point, at a given uh, half cycle, the voltage across the load is both positive and negative. And you take the average to calculate now that a blue curve that represents a sinusoidal waveform. Right. In a unipolar pulse width modulation, on the other hand, we call that a unipolar because as you see here, during half cycle of the reference signal, the voltage is all, always either positive or negative, but not both. The idea is different. Here we are have one reference signal and you're calculating Q1 and Q2 by simply comparing them. Here we now have two signals that are shifted in space by 180 degrees. You're shifted by 180 degrees. Q1 then will take the comparison of one signal and the carrier signal, and Q2 will look at the other signal and the carrier signal. And here we have Q1 and Q2 that you can give to the load. Uh, 
And um, as a result of this specific arrangement, the voltage across the load is always positive or always negative uh, during a half cycle. And that's why you call it a unipolar uh, pulse width modulation. So what do we do with this? Why do we need to go from a DC source to a AC source? Any um, any applications that you can think of? Yeah, uh, for like uh, power conservation across like long distances. If you're trying to get to, uh, you know, uh, going across long distances, yeah. Right. Yes. So if you go across uh, long distances, you probably want to increase the voltage to decrease the current and eliminate and minimize joule losses. Another application of this would be, let's say we have solar panels or something that creates a current that is not, uh, has an arbitrary waveform. And this arbitrary waveform cannot be input to the grid directly. It needs to be input to the grid at a specific voltage and at a specific frequency. So what it could do is to use the, um, to use the, inverter to now get that voltage to a perfectly DC voltage first and then from the DC voltage control uh, do sinusoidal pulse width modulation to get a perfectly sinusoidal waveform in the output at a frequency that we determine and then we can input that uh, that signal into the grid if you think about uh, um, hybrid cars or even in a uh, locomotive for example we have some sort of gen generator, electrical generator, like typically diesel or something in a locomotive, for example, that will create a AC voltage. As it rotates, it creates an AC voltage. That AC voltage may be converted into DC. And then from DC, we convert it back into AC. We convert it back into AC, but now with the ability to change the magnitude and to change the frequency. And then, only then, we will power the induction motors uh, in the drivetrain. Right? It's uh, and that's the way we control the speed. So that's another application of it. Another uh, idea, uh, another application of the inverter now is to have three phase instead of two phase. We use this, for example, to uh, control the induction machine or control a synchronous motor. If we have three phase. We want to control exactly the position of the rotating magnetic flux, which allows us to control the speed or the position of the motor. And that's one application of the three-phase inverter. We see here, it's basically the same H bridge with, uh, which, uh, with a additional wire. We have the same load, uh, three-phase load connected through the same neutral point. And now by choosing exactly the signals we need to, uh, we do to each of these transistors, we can modulate a resulting vector that uh, in a three phase system will have a specific orientation and you can change that orientation by changing the duty cycle applied to these transistors. Right. So this is also very useful for position control uh, or simply for frequency control uh, or that is speed control in induction motors and in uh, synchronous motors. Any questions here before we move on to actuators? So this is the power electronics part. You see how we build it up from transformers, AC to AC, then AC to DC, DC to DC, DC to AC, and even DC to three phase AC. Yeah. So that's mo all you need for mechatronics, it, it goes much deeper than what we covered. We really only did a introduction to power electronics. There are folks that are taking electrical engineering. They'll probably take one or two courses only on power electronics. But for us as mechatronic engineering uh, engineers, this is sufficient. And you know where to look for information if you end up working on more sophisticated power electronic systems. Are there any questions here? Oh, yeah, just a quick question, or not question, yeah. uh, but do you mind um, just going over, um, like, in the circle, how the arrows aren't drawn again? For this one? Yeah. Yes. So for 
the uh, vector space modulation, if you want to modulate, let's say, the black vector, we need to decompose that into three vectors. And these three vectors will tell us in which specific, uh, specific operating condition will run the inverter. Uh, and let's assume that the black vector can be controlled by the combination of these three vectors here. Right? Remember that each of these numbers represents one operating mode of the three-phase inverter. I don't remember exactly which ones are which, but for let's say, for example, that an, uh, one one zero would result in current flowing in this way. Right? If you switch to one uh, zero zero, that it would be a different uh, a different current. But this is to say that in the core, in the three phase arrangement that you have in a machine, for example, where phases are spaced uh, equally spaced in a, in a space that would create a resulting magnetic field. When we do, for example, one, one, zero, we are along the green vector. That's the resulting magnetic field in the core. When you do one, zero, zero, it would be the red one and so on. Now our question is, if we want to calculate, to, to display this one, how do we switch between these states and to create now a resulting vector that is the black one? We decompose this vector into three, and now we have the green, the black, and the blue. We can now move the magnitude of these vectors to this chart here. We have a reference signal that is the carrier signal. Sorry, we have a carrier signal that is the black one. And in this specific case, we see that A is along the positive line. So here we have the magnitude of A, which is this distance. A plus. For vector B, we are still using the positive, so that's the magnitude of B. C is the is using the negative axis, hence negative C, maintaining the same magnitude C here, but now negative. We can now compare the, the signals for A, for example, which is the uh, red slash purple here, I don't know what color that is. We can now compare that with the carrier signal. And whenever the carrier signal is greater than the, red, than the signal itself, then we don't activate that specific uh, phase. And otherwise, we'll activate that. So that it would result in a signal like this. If you go for B, B would be something like that. And if you go for C, C should be something like this. And that this tells us exactly in which sequence we should now switch the transformer. It would go 0, 0, 0 to 0 to 1, 0, 0 to 1, 1, 0, and so on. Right? So this gives us the timing for each of these specific operating modes. This is a function of time here. And the result is a set of instructions that we now give to the transformer saying we are going to hold the transformer at 0, 0, 0 for this amount of time. Then you're going to go to 1, 0, 0 for this amount of time, which is probably micro or nanoseconds. And we'll continue to do that uh, in a way that the average voltage created in the, the core points in the direction of this vector that we want. Are there any other questions for the power electronics part? Nope. All right, so let's do part two, where we start studying the actuators themselves. Now they have a way to, to uh, um, power them. So we started with electromechanical energy conversion that in an electromechanical system, we have three types of energy, the electrical energy and the mechanical energy. And the transition between them is done through the field energy or the electromagnetic or the magnetic energy that it will now connect the mechanical with the electrical. 
In the case of this simple uh, system here, we have a coil that will, where the electrical power is applied that it creates a magnetic field. And this magnetic field creates energy in the system that it now develops a force. If there is any motion in the system, this motion will come from changes in the energy. So the field energy is now transferred into mechanical energy. And to find that, to find that amount of, that, that rate of change, we can, uh, to, to find the force, we need to evaluate that rate of change. So the field energy is stored in the actuator depends on two things. It depends on the one stored in the core, that's the first integration here, and depends on the one stored in the air gap. That's the second term, where VC is the volume of the air gap uh, of the core, and VG is the volume of the air gap. So two types of energy. Typically, the energy in the air gap is much greater because it takes much more energy to magnetize something that has low permeability than something that has a high permeability. And in that case, this it can sometimes sometimes be neglected if you're using a high permeability core. Any variations in the magnetic field uh, energy is transferred to the mechanical energy, the mechanical system. And that's the principle behind finding the force. So the force is given as the partial derivative of the field energy with respect to the displacement. Right? Two ways to calculate that. One where the field energy uh, changes as the magnetic flux linkage is constant. The other one where the current is constant. So there's some confusion here typically because if you actually think about this system, both the current and the magnetic flux linkage are changing. We are making an assumption in two specific cases where the motion occurs rap uh, rapidly or slowly, that in one of the cases, the current remains constant. In the other case, the flux linkage remains constant. But in reality, they are both changing. The reason we are making this assumption is just to simplify the calculations later. When you do the derivative, we cannot take the derivative or even on one of these integrations later, assuming that one of these variables is constant. So this is an assumption. Right? In reality, both would be changing, but we are taking just one at a time. But regardless, we should get to the same result where the force is the derivative of the field energy or the field co-energy with respect to whatever is moving in the system. That's where we started. We can also relate this to the inductance because we know that if you consider the core to be a perfect inductor, we can say that the force will depend on the partial derivative of the energy stored in the inductor. So we will depend now on the inductance of this coil. If you take the partial derivative of the inductance with respect to displacement, that will also give us a force, right? And the inductance depends now on the distance between these plates which depends on the reluctance of the core. So if the reluctance is changing, there is a force that is being applied somewhere in a way that tends to minimize the reluctance and increase the inductance in the core. For these two examples, for example, uh, if you follow that, we came to these equations. The force between both sides of the air gap here simply depends on B squared to mu times A. Uh, that's the force developed on both sides. If we divide that by A, we get the force per unit area of air gap called the magnetic pressure. And you see that it depends, this force depends on two things, depends on the intensity of the magnetic flux and depends on the surface area that is being attracted from both, both sides. So now we know that if we apply a current here, we develop a magnetic field. The magnetic field will create a force that will tend to minimize the, the reluctance in the core. And that's the principle of operation of an actuator. And right? this is the principle of a, uh, could be the principle of a uh, electromagnet, for example, which is what we have in the right figure. If we, let's say, put a, a spring here like that, we can now control the displacement by controlling the intensity 
of the current. Now, no current, it will the, the, the spring will be at rest. When you apply a current, the plate moves towards the core, and depending on the intensity of the current, it now can control the position of that plate. Right? This is a very elementary actuator, but that's exactly what we use later to develop a DC motor or a uh, stepper motor. We can use this for a rotating machine. For example, all we need is a core that as it rotates, changes reluctance or change, changes um, inductance, well, the same. And the torque developed in the core will always tend to minimize the inductance. In this case here, we, we have two coils, one in the stator, one in the rotor. If we had just the stator coil and assuming that this is just a ferromagnetic part, Here, the torque provided by the stator on the rotor would always tend to align the rotor vertically, which is the point of minimum reluctance. And so if you are to the left or to the right, it will always tend to the same direction, which means that the torque provided here is independent of the current. This doesn't provide continuous rotation because once we reach that equilibrium point, we are stuck there. So what you can do is to either create more stators right, and replicate the stators at a different intervals, which is the operation principle of stepper motors, or add the secondary coil to the rotor. Now we have to deal with the interaction between these two magnetic fluxes. And if that is the, the, is the case, then you need to consider the total energy in the system that now depends on both coils, the stator and the rotor energy stored in each coil plus the effect of their mutual inductance, the effect of their mutual inductance. The inductance is a function of the reluctance following this expression, right, is inversely proportional to the reluctance, which means that it is a function of theta, it's a function of the rotor position. And as uh, we saw before, we can take the derivative of the field energy with respect to whatever is moving, in this case, theta, and that gives us the torque developed in the motor. For a reluctance motor, when the stator and the rotor are perfectly aligned like that, what is the torque developed? What is the torque developed here? Is it zero? It is zero, exactly. That is exactly zero, and because that is the point of minimum reluctance. The maximum torque would occur close to 90 degrees like that, right? or where you have the most momentum generated by that force. Right? But when they are perfectly aligned, the torque is zero. And that's the principle now of a rotating machine. That's how we created stepper motors. How did we build a stepper motor? Well, just take this stator and create another stator like that. But now shifted by 90 degrees. And now if you actuate one stator coil, we can align that vertically, the other one horizontally. And if you now time them properly, we can have a continuous rotation. So two types of stepper motors, bipolar and unipolar. And by bipolar and unipolar, it only has to do with the direction of the current flowing through the winding. If the current needs to be reversed, that's a bipolar. If the current does not need to be reversed, that, it's, that is a unipolar motor. In this case here, if you didn't have the second the coil in the rotor, this would be a reluctance motor. And regardless of the direction of the current, one coil is always applying torque in a given direction. Right? So there is no need to reverse the current here. Reluctance motors are always unipolar motors. A bipolar motor is a different story. In a bipolar motor, we have a magnet in the center of the um, stepper motor here. And now we need to look at in which direction we need to create a magnetic field. Is that going up or is it going down? If you want, let's say, create a convention here that uh, I forgot what we uh, used previously in the lecture, but let's say this is the north and this is the south pole. Right? And by convention, 
the magnetic flux goes from the north to south to the north pole. If this is what you have now, and we want to align this uh, rotor vertically, what should we do? Well, we should create a south pole on top, and we should create a north pole at the bottom, which means that our magnetic flux will have to go downwards. How do we create a magnetic flux downwards? Well, we need to look at the direction of the current. And to do that, we need to also see in which way the coil uh, revolves around the core. If you want that to go downwards, in which way is the, the, the current supposed to go? The current will need to go this way, following the uh, right-hand rule. We need to loop that way. How do you get a current looping that way? If the current loops that way, it will have to be coming from the bottom. Well, the current goes from the bottom, loops like that, and the magnetic flux goes downward. So the current is coming from here and exiting like that, which means that for that magnetic flux, we would need to create a current going out from B plus, going in from B minus. This net requires a negative voltage through the bridge. How do we create a negative voltage through the bridge? Well, we would need to activate for a negative voltage, we need to activate Q1 or Q2? Q2. We need to yeah. activate. Yeah, Q2. Why is it not coming from B plus if you want the if you want it to go down? So if it's coming from B plus. Shouldn't it be like, or wouldn't it be uh, from Q2, and then that will the, the current goes from B plus, and then it will go down. So if the current comes from B plus, the current goes like that, right? And so the current goes like that. It rotates in a way, so it goes from the it, it, it enters from the front of that stator pole, and then it loops like that. So it goes up. So the magnetic flux would go up, right? So it's reversed. The current needs to enter from B minus. To enter from B minus, we would need to activate this transistor and that transistor. According to our definition, would be Q1. So we need, really need to pay attention here to two things. To the way we define the north and south, south poles, and to the way the windings go around the pole. Now, this is very important. In uh, the quizzes, I switched the, some of the directions here. So each problem is independent. You need to analyze each problem independent. Another way to do this, yes. Sorry, do you mind just uh, like explaining it for what it would be for uh, like using the A, A plus and A minus then? Like Sorry, what, 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 what would be? Yeah, so let's assume, for example, that we do. Let's take this one here, and let's uh, actuate Q uh, three. So if you do Q three, current goes like this. Yeah, goes through yeah. negative A. If the current goes through negative A, the current is looping. Going, it goes from the front and then loops like that, goes from the front and then loops behind, right? So the magnetic flux points that way. Correct? Yeah, are we good up to this point? Yeah. So this is the South Pole. This is the North Pole. Right? Which means that the south of the magnet will align with this north, and the north of the magnet will align with that south. Okay. And then if you activate Q4, then the flux goes in the other direction, and then the magnet would go at 180 degrees from what it is when you activate Q3. Okay. 
Okay. All right. So this is one way to do that is using a is a H bridge to reverse the current. Our idea, fundamental idea, is to change the direction of the magnetic flux. To do that, what it could do instead, if you don't want to use H bridges, is to cut in half each of the coils in the stator, and then have a um, ground at halfway halfway through the coil. So here, let's say you put a ground there. If you now activate uh, activate A, current goes from in uh, goes in in one direction. If you activate A prime it goes in the other direction and that will create a magnetic field that is in, a, in, a, in the opposite direction so if you go with a let's say here a goes that way in which way is the current flowing the current comes in behind and loops from the it loops at the front so the magnetic flux through the coil is downwards which means that through the magnet is going to go upwards this creates a south pole here and a north pole there. The, ad the advantage here is that we don't need to reverse the current in a coil because you're now choosing which side of the coil to activate. The current is always flowing in the same direction. There is no need to reverse the current. We are reversing the direction of the magnetic flux by activating one or the other half of that specific coil, but there is no need to reverse the current. So that's the unipolar stepper motor configuration. How do you distinguish a bipolar to, from a unipolar when you look at a stepper motor? Well, simply by looking at the number of wires. A bipolar will have four wires. And if you see anything more than four wires, it's probably a unipolar motor, now, typically six. Here, the uh, neutral is connected to the same wire, but it will have uh, actually two neutral wires coming from each pair of coils. Okay. Six wires unipolar, four wires would be a bipolar. How can we interface this? Well, here we simply need switches. We don't need H bridges. Uh, a MOSFET would be sufficient. Moving on from stepper motors, they have DC motors. On oh, the DC motors now, I think we, uh, your experts in DC motors. We use this extensively here in three lectures and we had control systems and everything. So I'm not going to spend too much time here. One thing to consider is that from the equations that we obtained from the mechanical and the electrical part, we can calculate the steady state volt, uh, steady state speed and the steady state torque. These are the important equations here as a function of all motor characteristics and as a function of the load torque that we are trying to drive there. And when you buy a DC motor, you will see these curves. You will see a torque speed curve and uh, for different voltages, which should resemble something like that. So there's a speed and torque. And as the voltage increases, we should see this linear uh, curves increasing in magnitude. There is typically an operating range that is recommended that will be marked in the data sheet. Let's say this is the operating range that you should use in a nominal operation. If you go beyond that, there are certain areas where you can sustain the, the motor in that operating area for a certain amount of time. And beyond that, you're probably going to damage the motor. Specifically, this is one of concern. When the speed is zero, the torque is very high. That's what we call the stall torque. And the stall torque can only be sustained for a few milliseconds before um, you fry the coils in, in the road. Okay. Our next motor now from D, moving from DC to AC is the induction motor. So what do we need to know about induction motors essentially? Essentially induction motors have two sets of coils, one that produces a revolving magnetic field and another coil that is in that revolving magnetic field. It's subjected to a change in magnetic field that creates a current in its own coil, and that current creates an induction. The induction opposes the changes in the magnetic field from the revolving magnetic field. This results in a torque being applied to the coil in the direction of motion. Right. And 
which means that the rotor and the stator must rotate at slightly different speeds because if they rotate at the same speed, there is no change in magnetic field from the rotor's perspective. We can model this as a transformer. Once again, two sets of coils sharing the same magnetic field. We can see that as a transformer. The difference compared to a transformer is that the impedance seen by the rotor winding depends on its speed, depends on the slip factor that is the difference between the synchronous speed and the rotor speed. And that a factor S, which is comprised between zero and one, the slip factor, now changes the impedance of the secondary winding. And that changing in impedance uh, results in uh, changing in impedance is, or the torque developed by the motor is proportional to the, that, that changing change in impedance. The torque depends on the current, right, which we which we can relate to the sorry. The torque depends on the current, which we can relate to the input voltage. To control the torque, control the voltage, control the current. To control the speed, now it's change we need to change the synchronous speed, the speed at which the revolving magnetic field operates that it would be now through the frequency applied to the motor right a synchronous motor same working principle but now we are powering the rotor with an external dc source so this becomes a permanent magnet and as a permanent magnet it will always follow the position of the rotating magnetic field and that's why we call it synchronous because it rotates at the same speed as the synchronous speed. Another main advantage here is other the fact that you now have a very specific speed and you know the speed you're operating at, is that the load should not affect the speed. The load will affect how much power you're drawing from the, the electrical source, but the torque should not affect the speed. If the speed is any other speed than the synchronous speed, the motor loses synchrony and doesn't operate properly. So it must be always rotating at the synchronous speed. And that's the main advantage in synchronous mode. Another variation of these motors is the single phase induction motor. How did you model it? We modeled this using the theory of revolving magnetic fields. We saw that by we have a pulsating magnetic pulsating magnetic field in one direction. It doesn't rotate anymore. It just simply pulses in the same direction, and that it can be uh, can be modeled as two revolving magnetic fields with which have the same magnitude but opposite directions. Two equivalent circuits now: one for the forward revolving field, one for the backward revolving field. You see that it's very similar to the induction machine, but now these slip factors are two different slip factors. One is for the forward field, one is the reverse field. And that changing in impedance, again, is what will create the torque, but now the torque depends on the relative difference between the impedances of the revolving part of the forward and the backward revolving parts. And when you look at the torque, you see that the torque depends on the current. Right? It doesn't depend um, on the load applied to it. Simply depends also on the synchronous speed that is typically fixed once once we determine the voltage, the frequency of operation. So these things don't start by their own because we only have a pulsating magnetic field, and once we put a, a coil in that pulsating magnetic field it cannot start because the field is not revolving. Another example of this that is not a starting um, self-starting motor is the synchronous motor. The synchronous motor, if you remember, cannot be started on its own. It needs an external uh, supply or we, can, we have to start it as an induction motor. But that's a bit different because the revolving magnetic field is rotating too fast and makes the rotor vibrate. Here, the magnetic field is simply pulsating in one direction. So we need to give it an initial spin for it to start rotating. 
and how do we do that? Well, there are many ways. One way is to add a sec uh, secondary winding that is shifted with respect to the first winding by 90 degrees mechanically. And then you do that electrically as well. We add the capacitor with, with a parallel field here. And this capacitor is chosen in a way that the current through the secondary, the auxiliary winding and the main winding is 90 degrees out of phase. And what is the purpose? The purpose is to cancel the back revolving field, the backward revolving field, is to add up the forward components of the revolving magnetic field and to cancel the components of the backward field. Right? And now we have finally something that rotates and as it rotates, then you can see the machine as when it starts as an induction machine. And once the rotor starts, then you can open the switch, disconnect the second branch, and the motor operates as an induction motor. Okay, so let's summarize this which uh, these motors. Which motors are not self-starting? Which motors are not self-starting? DC. The DC is self-starting. The DC is self-starting. Once you apply a voltage to it, it will start rotating. The stepper motor, well, stepper motor is also self-starting. Uh, self Which ones are not self-starting? Uh, is an induction motor self-starting? Three-phase induction motor self-starting? Yes. 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 Is a single-phase induction motor self-starting? No. No, the initial torque is zero. Is a synchronous motor self-starting? Yes. A synchronous motor is not self-starting. Oh. A synchronous motor is not self-starting. Why is that? Do you remember the idea of having, let's say, a magnet like that? Right? And you have a revolving magnetic field, let's say, that goes this way. And then immediately after it goes downwards. All right, so first, like that, let's assume we have north, south, and north, and I have south and north. When you are in this configuration, torque is applied like that. And when you are in this configuration, torque is applied in the opposite direction. So because this is rotating very fast, the torque experience, experienced by the magnet is clockwise and counterclockwise, and that changes very fast when this is at standstill. So the result is that the magnet vibrates, the magnet vibrates and doesn't self-start, doesn't start rotating. So once you give it a spin, then it will start rotating. So how do we self-start, sorry, no, not how self-start, how do we start synchronous motor? We could simply short the windings in the rotor winding, so we start it as a induction machine. And once it catches the speed, then we apply the voltage to it and then it becomes a magnet and then it just follows the synchronous speed. So the synchronous motor is not self-starting. Everything else, the induction motor is self-starting, the single phase is not self-starting. Which motors uh, provide the greatest starting torque of them all? Yes. DC motor because the initial current is is very high. How is the induction the initial torque in a induction machine? It's typically low because it takes time for a magnetic field to develop in the secondary winding. So highest starting torque would be a DC motor. Highest holding torque would be a stepper motor. So it really depends on the application you are choosing for um, uh, to, to, to de de depending on the application you'll be choosing different motors because they serve different purposes and have very different characteristics. Okay, so I think we are gonna stop here today. There's a lot of talking. But I hope that this lecture gives you an idea of how all, all everything we covered in this course is interconnected. Right? We, it's here for a reason, and um, it will cover the basis for you to develop your mechatronics projects to interface motors, actuators with 
uh, microcontrollers, and that was the main objective. What else can we say? Um, I think that's that's pretty much it. So really, we have two courses in one. We have actuators and power electronics in one course. So that's why you have so much to cover in, um, in 21 lectures. But now we have the basis to explore this more. If you go into more sophisticated control systems, power electronics, or modeling of ladder mechanical systems, I think this gives you a good base to, uh, to get started with that. So before we um, wrap it up, I just want to mention that though, if you're interested in part-time or full-time research positions, you can contact me. This is my lab website. There are some positions posted there. Later on, if you're looking for uh, grad school, master's or PhD, you can also contact me. We can discuss then. If you have interest, send me an email. Uh, most of my research is based on things that we covered in class. They are applied to biomedical applications, but that doesn't mean you need to know any biomedical engineering. Uh, we are applying robotics most of the time or mechatronic systems to solve some sort of engineering problems in a biomedical context. But it's that, that's as far as it goes in the, the, bio, um, the biomedical side. So if you're interested in any of these positions, you can take a look at the website, you can let me know. Um, and if you're interested even in part-time, full-time uh, positions as undergraduates, that's also a possibility. There are several scholarships available to students. 